You are about to enter your own world that you create and run. This is the Ace Roleplaying Games official channel. Hi everyone, and hi Acers. Welcome to the Ace Roleplaying Games channel. I'm your host, Mason Emerson, and I'm still in the process of working on my new office and I'm going to try and figure out where my best um, camera angles are. So this is still a work in progress, but I think turning off the overhead light might have helped because at least now I'm not getting the glare from that up there above and coming into the camera. And I'm hoping this video is a better quality for you. So give me a thumbs up if, if this is something that you enjoy today. Um, and share it around, share it around. Let's get this going. Let's get Ace off the ground and moving around. So today we're going to continue doing our situational rules that we've been covering so far. And we've covered shotguns and size and scale last time. So this time, in number 14, we're going to cover, um, we're going to cover speed to start with. Now, speed is something that you got to kind of sometimes consider. And if the, the rules here say that if the relative speed between the attacker and the defender is 60 miles per hour or more, apply the relative speed penalty. So that means... If you're both moving at 60 miles an hour, there is no relative speed difference and there is no penalty. Unless, of course, you can account unstable platform, which we'll get to in another video. But what we do cover with speed is this. If the relative dif difference between speed is so if somebody's coming in a car and you have to try and take a shot to try and like take out the tire, for example. That's what your hero's trying to do. You're going to try and take out the tire. Now, because the tire is only about this big, you there might be a penalty for hitting that target because it's moving. But to even just hit the, the car in general, you're going to have a minus one penalty because that's moving at 60 miles an hour and you're stationary. If it's moving at 120, that's a minus two. 100, 240, that's minus four. And then you start getting into mocks and things like that. And the basic rule for converting miles per hour to pace, if you're going to be comparing the two, is multiply the miles per hour times 1.5, and that gives you pace. Divide the pace by 1.5 to get miles per hour. So if an average person has a pace of 6, we're going to be talking... So if we did 6 divided by 1, it was 6. But it's 6 divided by 1.5, so... An average pace of a, an average pace of 1.5 is going to be about three miles an hour. So you're going to be moving about three miles an hour normally. So that's that kind of gives you an idea of how movement works in Savage Worlds. Now, if you're going to run and move up to six miles an hour, essentially, and you know, given the running rules and everything like that, then that's part of what makes shooting or doing an action in that time period, it logically makes sense as to why that would be a problem. And when you are running, and that's one of the parts that we covered in the movement part, but there is that minus two penalty to whatever you do after you run. But sometimes you gotta. Sometimes you just have to. Sometimes that that guy with the machine guns firing at your character, and you gotta run. So that's why we're going to make sure that we run and run hard. So that's movement, or that's, or that's speed. And the superhero's companion, which I'll get to in many later videos, but I'm gonna, because I'm gonna cover ways of applying some of the superpowers, only some. I'm not gonna go into every one of them like I've been going into every one of these rules, but these are because you as a game master need to understand essentially where these apply. And that's why I don't, I try not to read the whole quote from the book because that's going to give you even more depth and more detail. And that's going to be on you to really do the research. And here's one of the big tips that I'll give you. Before you run an adventure in which you know that that, that situational rule is going to be used, go back to the book and read it again just to make sure you got the idea of how it worked. Because I know I've made mistakes. I've even made some mistakes in these videos. And... That's okay. So being as I come from a perfectionism background, I want to tell you something that I just learned yesterday. 
And this is something that is going to help me so much. And I'm going to start doing this. Anytime you make a mistake as a game master, after the, after the se sessions, well, first of all, don't admit it. That's the first rule. Don't admit the mistake. Don't be like, oh, so, unless it's a pretty big mistake and somebody else calls you on it or something like that. Then be willing to say, yeah, yeah. But if your players don't notice it, but you notice it, don't say anything. Just keep on going. Keep the adventure going. Don't stop the adventure to just say, oh, man, I'm sorry. I screwed that up. Let's try that again. Unless you feel you have to. But where you really admit to yourself that you made the mistake is after the session, when you're reviewing the session for yourself, go back and think, oh, man, I totally played that speed rule wrong. And I was supposed to put a minus two penalty on there instead of a minus one. But I only gave him a minus one penalty. So what you do is now pull out your phone, because, hey, we've all got them, and record yourself saying what you would say as a friend and a coach to your very best friend who's trying to game master this. And say, hey, Pete, I know you were trying to run those speed rules correctly, but you did miss it. But that's okay, because I still love you. You still gave him a great game. And you didn't stop and make a big deal out of it when you did mess it up. You just kept on going. You kept the story flowing. And that, after you get that done, just wait a day or two, listen back to it, and listen to yourself say it to yourself. And right there, that's going to help you to not give that negative self-talk up here. Because we're meaner to ourselves than anybody ever could be to us. We need to be nicer to ourselves. And we need to be more forgiving. And we need to give ourselves grace to allow ourselves to become amazing game masters. Because the most amazing game masters aren't the ones who get the rules perfect every time. They're the ones who know when to apply the rules and when to pass on the rules in order to make the story better. The greatest game masters are not the ones who, who never make a mistake of their uh, in, in their game mastering, but they're the ones who are willing to forgive themselves when they do. So be patient with yourself. You're, you're going to get this. And you're going to get life. Those things, just, they'll come. Be patient. So let's continue on and actually talk about another status. Stunned. So this, go, this could be a stun gun. One of those two-pronged zapper... <laughs> Or it could be a taser. Or it could be um, somebody who got the drop and they sap you in the back of the head. Or you have the bad guy sap him in the back of the head and say you're doing a film noir kind of story. This is stunned. And stun guns, creature abilities, with, uh, the stun power, there are things that cause or electrical hazards. Things that just shock the brain and nervous system and make the character essentially helpless until... You shake it off until they manage to shake it off. So stun characters, here's, here's the rules from Savage Worlds. They're distracted, removed at the end of the victim's next turn as usual. They are vulnerable, but that remains until after they recover from being stunned. They fall prone or to their knees based on what you tell them that happens. And they can't move or take any actions, but they do keep getting dealt a, a um, action card. And... They don't count towards gang up bonuses. So you can't have somebody stunned. Oh, and act it out. We'll get to that in another video. But yeah, we're going to talk about the way you engage your players by you being engaged yourself. So zap, they fall down. Now the bad guy doesn't have this guy to worry about, but he still has to worry about the other two behind him. Those guys still get the gang up bonus. So at the start of their turn, about the same time you'd make a spirit roll to, uncover, to recover from being shaken. You make a vigor roll as a free action. If you succeed, you're no longer stunned. But you remain vulnerable till the end of that next turn. So it's going to take them a, a, a second to stagger back to their feet and be like, okay, yeah, I got this. And then with a raise, the vulnerable state goes away at the end of this turn. So that's how stun works. Now, you saw me in the in the cover slide going like this. 
That's because I'm supporting you. I'm cheering you on. I'm giving you the little rah-rah. And support is a big thing in Savage Worlds. Because here's the thing. Sometimes the monster or the villain is really hard to hit. But that's where we use gang-up bonuses, tests, and support to make it so the make it so that the hero who's going to next act on the villain has a shot at actually hitting them and or damaging them. So let's talk about support. Sometimes characters need to cooperate or help an ally with a task. So the, the GM can, you, you as the GM can declare it possible and the supporting characters get to roll the relevant skill on their action if the game is in rounds. So that's one of the things that I have done wrong. And I've done this wrong a lot of times. I'll say, well, well, Becky, you get to roll for support, or you get to make this roll, but anybody else can roll support rolls to help you out. But what it needs to happen is if you were in combat and she's trying to disarm the bomb, everybody else around the table who's going to support her is going to make their roll before she makes her final roll. So that might mean she goes on hold and waits for them to give them her support, their support. And they, in what you do, what you have the supporting players do is they, is on their turn, if you're in rounds, they declare which of their trait, with which um, trait the ally has that they're attempting to support. So you can support it. And okay, here's where this is not exactly, it's not exactly specified at this point, um, but until later on. So I will jump ahead a little bit here. You can choose, and often as a game master, let the players choose which of their skills they want to use to support the person who's making the role. Now, first of all, the rule. A success on your support trait role gives the acting character a plus one to their trait role. A critic a um, raise gives two on the support roll, and like like extra damage when doing when rolling to hit, you only get one bonus die. So it's either plus one or plus two. A critical failure on the support roll subtracts two from the, the lead actor's total. Sometimes, if somebody's like, cut that wire right there, cut that wire right there, they're, the person who's trying to do it is like, ah, get out of my way. So support bonuses end at the end of the, the recipient's turn, whether they used them or not. And maybe they changed their mind and did something different than the one they were supported for. The maximum bonus from support rolls is plus four. So if you have four friends who each give you plus one, that's plus four, and that's as much as you can get. But if you have if you have two people who give you a plus four, then maybe the other two can give can do a test against the bad guy to reduce challenge to reduce difficulties. But we'll get to tests again, like I said, in another video. Very soon though. Um so here it says it. Players and GMs should be creative when making support roles. An adventurer with survival, for example, might make a role to find useful herbs for an ally attempting a healing check. So that would be when Aragorn sends the sends or he goes off to get um he calls it um he calls it Wolfsbane. And when they understand finally, but you know, when, in that scene in the movie where he asks for Wolfsbane essentially to be able to heal Frodo, but here's the thing in the book, he just actually takes care of the, he takes care of Frodo there. And it's not until later he tell, that he renames it Wolfsbane. That, so they, they understand it there at, um, at Gondor. But anyway, that was just a recent reread. So you can do general encouragement, like use a persuasion role. And that is a perfectly acceptable way if the GM's okay with that. And be as loose as you 
can as a as a game master to let people come up with creative skills and uses of their of their abilities to help now if you're doing a support role with strength there is no limit to that so you're going to you're you're going to be adding your strength to the strength role of somebody who's trying to pick up a car. And we've mentioned that in an earlier video. So let's talk about a support versus test. The support option is, can be used narratively, and it can be used against an opponent narratively. But it only... It, it only helps as above. So it helps when somebody's making an action against an opponent. But if you want to trip up like an ogre to help a friend make a fighting roll against him, you don't actually trip the ogre, and it's not made prone, distracted, or vulnerable. You're just supporting your friend, giving a plus one or plus two to your friend's fighting roll. Now, if you use the test option, which, like I said, probably coming up in the next video. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, yes, it is. So if you use the test option, that will give you... A, a way of affecting the opponent. The advantage for a player making a support role over a test is to help an ally and avoid a more difficult opposed role for the test. So it, it just is a way of helping your allies and ways of working together. And that's one of the things that I have to give it to Shane and his group. I love you guys for this because this game very much encourages working together to make better outcomes. And I love that. So moving on to suppressive fire. It turns a fire, it turns a firearm or other rapid fire weapon into an area of effect attack. It trades a hell of ammo to keep the enemy's heads down. So this is I I've experienced this. Let's let's put it this way. Paintball. I was I was on a team, and I had gotten out to a really good position. I only had my head, which headshots were off limit, and maybe a foot of my back, maybe even six inches of my back, a, vi a viewable from behind above a big boulder. And I had trees on either side of my position. I was wearing my mask, and I was sitting there, and I saw my uncle coming up the hill. I had my gun. And I had a semi-automatic gun. And he'd poke his head up and I'd fire at him and he'd duck back down. And he tried to get closer and I fired at him again and he backed off. And then I heard this whack on the tree to my right. And a whack on the tree to my left. And then pow, right between my shoulder blades. I stood up, holding my gun up, you know, admitting that I was dead. Turns out it was my dad. He was on my own team and I just was victim of friendly fire. But I was using my gun to make suppressive fire to keep my uncle, who was on the other team, for making it up the hill. So it the weapon has to be able to fire at least as rapidly as a revolver and can't require reloading between shots. So an arrow could not really do it. But if you have a revolver, you can bam, 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 bam every turn and just and fire off three times the usual number of bullets for the rate of fire. So it's bam, bam, bam. And then again, bam, bam, bam. And you're holding the trigger down if it's a single action. And so you use three times the num usual number of bullets for, for its rate of fire, according to what it's listed at in its gear, in its gear section, and always incur recoil, regardless of the weapon's original rate of fire. Rock and roll edge, bipods, and tripods negate the recoil as usual. So... You have to place a medium blast template on the tabletop and make a shooting roll, a single shooting die, regardless of the rate of fire. And r the rate of fire comes into maximum casualties. So the you got to figure your range, your illumination, the recoil penalty. Remember recoil, that puts a minus two on the shot because it's representing the fact that this gun's bucking in your hands. And... You apply that to, and you, you apply all that when you put down the center of the template. Then you compare the total 
to each target in the template and consider the modifiers that apply to each. So there's if there's the cover or the dodge edge, deflection power, something like that. Success means that the target is distracted. Raise means they're actually hit. And um, there is no bonus damage if you're using suppressive fire. But that die still can ace, so that can still give you a little bit more damage. Every target under the template can be distracted, but it can only cause damage to number of targets equal to the weapon's rate of fire. So if you get a raise, you can you you can actually damage up to whatever the weapon's rate of fire is. So if you're doing that with a revolver with a rate of fire of one, that means one shot per round, then you can go bam, 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 but only one of those bullets can actually hit and do damage. And you, and you choose the target among the possible choices that you've hit. So that's really what that that's really what the idea of suppressive fire is. So we're going to pick up next time with surprise. And we're going to also look into the tests and things like that. But I want to just thank you all for coming. I want to thank you for sharing this, this adventure with me. I'm still learning. I'm still growing. I still have a lot to do. I mean, I've got a video over here that I even want to watch at some point about using the editing software that I actually pay for. I just keep forgetting how to I keep forgetting to use it. And I know I don't make the greatest videos yet. And they're not cool and flashy yet, but I do hope that you're enjoying them. I hope you're learning from them and I hope you're sharing them. So anyway, just remember the world is a better place because you're in it. You are amazing and you hold the potential for so much more amazing than you've ever thought you do. I love you and I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you're a member of the Ace Role Playing Games Club and I hope that you are helping to make other people's lives better because you're here in it. Until next time, we're gaming for good.